These are very small corals, no more than an inch tall. Once again, each of them was occupied by a single individual. These are brachiopod shells. A brachiopod has normally two shells, so the individual has uh, had its shells broken away from one another. These have been totally dissolved out, also from Permian limestone. In these brachiopods, external spines, which the animal used to anchor itself into the mud of the sea floor, are clearly visible. Silicification is not always the means of preserving very fine, delicate features. In this horn coral, the growth lines, which are the lines that you can see uh, running around the uh, circumference of the coral, are still the original calcium carbonate shell. The calcium carbonate was deposited by the coral according to the temperature and the daylight available. And it's from specimens such as this that we can draw conclusions about the uh, daily growth of corals. By attempting to recognize seasonal growth and the number of days in the four seasons of the year, it's possible to make some estimate from corals as well preserved as that one of the number of days that there were in the year at the time that the fossil grew. And strangely enough, it's been found that there are good reasons for believing that in the Devonian and in the Silurian, there were a great many more days in the year than there are now, something like, oh, 410, 415 days per year instead of 365. In other words, the, wor the Earth was going around faster, was rotating faster. Um, <clears throat> so it's possible to draw some very interesting conclusions from fossils if you can read them correctly. Um, preservation of impressions of membranes is quite rare, but also occurs sometimes. This is the skeleton of a medium-sized Jurassic reptile, which was able to fly. The skeleton is quite crushed on the right there, but the membranes, which gave the reptile a wingspan of two or three feet, are still quite well preserved. This is the impression of a soft-bodied organism, rather like a worm. And this is a somewhat smaller, but more complex-looking worm. These trails in this once muddy sediment were produced by soft-bodied organisms. So we do get some record by the means of impressions and by trails, even of organisms that were totally soft and which totally themselves rotted away. There are other peculiar ways of fossilization. Uh, one of the most odd and most unique is in California, where tar pits of a million or two years ago appeared to animals unfamiliar with what tar looked like, obviously, as good watering holes. And they went for a drink, and they found themselves engulfed in tar. By fishing out the skeletons today, we're able to make reconstructions of, for example, saber-toothed tigers and this panther. Um, <clears throat> the preservation of insects in amber is another rather odd preservation. Uh, you may have seen pieces of amber with insects in them in expensive bracelets. Sometimes we're not even sure whether the traces we've got in rocks are fossils or not. For example, these are from a very old sandstone in the Sudbury Basin, and we're still not sure whether those are traces of life or whether they're something that was or were produced by something that was not living, by some phenomenon of water coming out of the sand or something like that. Now, the Precambrian record, the Precambrian fossil record, has got a, quite a lot of algae in it like that, similar to the, this specimen. There are also, in some places, the record of Precambrian cells. There are some in the Gunflint Church, you may remember. Also, at Bitter Springs, which is a sediment, or a place in Australia where there is sediment uh, like that of the Gunflint, but the age is about 900 million years, there's evidence that sex had been discovered at Bitter Springs. There are some uh, cells there which are dividing in a manner which suggests that they were produced by uh, a sexual union. And that was very important for 
fossils, so very important for the development of life. Once sex had evolved, then it was possible for variable offspring to be produced, and for those offspring perhaps to be a little better adapted than their parents, and so to, by natural selection, improve the viability of the organisms and to evolve new, better adapted species and so forth. Now, unfortunately, between 900 million years ago and the uh, next rich fauna, there's a big gap. There was a, a glaciation that lasted perhaps 100 million years between about 8 and 700 million years ago. And the geological record is almost blank of fossils. And the next fauna that we find is very, very rich in diversified organisms. The um, Paleozoic faunas of 600 million years ago are extremely rich, and this at Ediacara, which immediately precedes those Cambrian faunas in Australia, is quite rich also. Let's have a look at the Ediacara fauna. This impression is probably that of a jellyfish. When it was alive, it would have floated near the surface, filtering organisms out of the water. It, it must have become stranded in shallow water or have died and sunk to the bottom. The divisions of its body are quite complex. In the central part of this cast is yet another impression. This organism has no known relatives. It may be related to the sea urchins, and it's thought to have lived on the sea floor itself. These sea pens, or sea whips, as they seem to be, are also only left impressions in the fossil record. They look rather plant-like and probably stood several inches high and waved above the sea floor, being anchored at their base. The impressions are rather plant-like. This impression that you've seen already is that of a flatworm-like organism. It's one of the commonest fossils at Ediacara. And this that you've also seen is of a worm-like organism that probably lived in much the same way on the sea floor. Let me emphasize what you've just seen there. Those fossils from the Ediacara Hills of Australia are the first fossils which we find that were composed of many cells. Each of those jellyfish was a many-celled organism. Each of the worms was composed of many cells. That's a tremendous evolutionary jump from the single-celled organisms which preceded in the fossil record 200 million years earlier. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, there's a worldwide or seemingly worldwide glaciation in between those two parts of the fossil record. And we don't know exactly how animal life